Didn't that feel good? I just kind of rested in that a minute. I don't know about you, but that was nice. Thank you. Your song, your, oh, your prelude. That was just nice. It was kind of, ah. Anyway, all right. <laughs> now that I've had a moment. <laughs> good morning, church. And good morning, church. We are glad you are here uh, this morning to worship with us. We have a beautiful day when it's raining. Thank you, God. (laughs) Finally, we're excited about that, and we're excited that everyone is here this morning. We're going to have a special uh, honor here in just a little bit. Um, I will remind you, if you have a praise or concern you want lifted up during our prayer time, if you will fill that out on one of these little yellow cards, there's some in the back of the pews there. You can either drop it in this basket up here or during our opening hymn if you just want to hold it up. uh, The deacons will, will grab those and get those up to me as well. But at this point, I would encourage you to rise in body or spirit, and we will open our worship with number 56, For the Beauty of the Earth. Will you pray with me? Oh, holy God, we do lift our hearts in praise of you this morning in grateful praise of all that you are, how you move in this world, how you move among us, how you move within us. Lord, there are so many ways we recognize uh, your love and grace in our lives and in this place, Lord, and we're so grateful uh, to be able to gather here this morning. And we want to know you. We want to experience you today. So we say, come, uh, uh, gracious God, come, Brother Jesus, come, Holy Spirit, rise up in a mighty way in our worship this day. The power of Christ that we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be seated, and uh, we're going to have our special honor at this point. Um, I've told Norm and Roberta to just have a seat right there. In a little bit, I'll have them stand up so everybody can see them. Uh, But we're going to, I got a few things to say first. (laughs) So from time to time, a congregation designates a faithful disciple of Christ uh, to be elder emeritus as a way of giving special recognition to an individual or individuals who have made extraordinary contributions to the life of the church through his or her many years of faithful and loving service. Today, we first want to acknowledge uh, the elder emeritus who is here as well, Uh, Raymond Dale Blunt, can you stand for us, Raymond, or wave to us or something? There he is. 
There he is. Uh, Raymond Dale was honored uh, in 2019, so thank you uh, for your service in the past and for your continued dedication to First Christian Church. Today, we are recognizing and honoring Norm and Roberta Mikesell. If you don't know them or uh, anything about what they've done here, let me tell you a little bit. Norm and Roberta have served across many areas of the church. Norm first served as an elder under the Reverend Dr. Larry Kuntz, uh, who was a pastor here at that time. Norm served again as elder under uh, Pastor Mark Poindexter. And Norm and Roberta were both serving a term as elders when I first came here uh, to First Christian. Uh, but those are just, um, th these two have also served in lots of other areas and positions as well. Norm has been a stewardship chair, a board chair. He has served on the worship committee and as a trustee. And the two of them uh, co-chaired uh, church growth for a time. Roberta has also served on the worship committee as well as personnel. Uh, she's been a deacon, given the children's moment uh, here during worship, uh, served on a vision team as well. And uh, she also was part of the team teaching of the Young Christian Sunday School class for uh, many years. One of the things I got to enjoy quite a bit uh, was Roberta's leadership of the Elderberries, where we took lots of fun trips, and she had things planned for us, places to go, things to see. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and she did that for five years. And we should also acknowledge that this by no means is a retirement celebration. <laughs> it's more of a time to recognize the gifts of these two uh, faithful folks, uh, for their faithfulness that they have shown and uh, the love and faithfulness they continue to share. It is a time where we encourage uh, and ask you for your continued guidance and uh, support of the ministries of First Christian Church, whether that's in an official or non-official uh, manner. So friends, I'm going to ask Norm and Roberta to stand, uh, and then I would ask you also uh, to help me honor these faithful two. We have certificates for each of you, and um, we ordered pins, and they're almost here. <laughs> so you get to come back, <laughs> and we'll get you your pins so you can wear those. Let's pray and be seated. Gracious God, your Holy Spirit works within these faithful ones, Norman, Roberta, amazing folks that we love so much. And we are forever grateful for uh, their vision and courage to step forth in faith and the way they have served in so many ways here at Martinsville First Christian Church. May you continue to bless uh, all of our needs here within the church, uh, along with their guidance and wisdom that Norma and Roberta, I'm sure, will continue to share with us. Uh, we continue uh, to water and tend the seeds of faith that they have planted through their many years and many acts of service. The prayer of Christ that we pray. Amen. And now we invite the children to come forward for our children's moment with Miss Janet. Good morning. I brought a globe with me today. Do you want to look at that globe? You can hold it and pass it down. Yeah, you're doing just what everybody likes to do with a globe, is it? Spin it. That's right. That globe came from um, a long way away from here. It came from China. I was on a vacation there and found that and just thought it was interesting. It doesn't have any words on it. It just has the shapes of the continents, and you can see the blue of the oceans. But I just thought it was interesting to look at. Well, today we're going to talk about, think about, the first words in the Bible. Do you know what they are? In the beginning. And what did God do in the beginning? He made the heavens and he made the earth. Man, that guy must be smart. He knew it had to spin, it had to turn on an axis. He knew it had to have so much daylight, so much darkness. He knew that it needed so much water because you couldn't go to the store back then and get more water. You had to have it right there. You know, had to keep raining and doing all that. And then, besides that, what did he do? Then he, then, he brought, then he brought forth all those plants, all those animals, the birds. He knew that we had to have 
unfortunately, flies and bees and wasps and those kinds of things because we need those. We need bees to make honey, to pollinate the flowers. He knew all of those things. He also needed, knew we needed koalas for cuddling. <laughs> Better not color, cuddle one, though. We needed dogs. We needed cats. We needed all those things. Think about it. Would you have been able to make a list like that in the beginning to know that we needed all those things? Man, he's smart. It's just unbelievable, but he knew, and he knew how to put it all together so it would keep going year after year after year after year. Well, our scripture today is taken from that very first verse, but then it's also taken from a verse in John, which says, I get to the right place here, says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, word is capitalized. Hmm, what's that mean? Do you know? It means it's special. It means it's something godly when they put a capital, wise, a capital letter on a word like that. So when it says that in the beginning was the word, God's word was in the very beginning too. And when it says he was with God, who was he? Jesus. Jesus was there too. My gosh, how smart God was. He knew that he needed his son there with him to get all of this going. He also knew that, and Jesus had to learn this, that you know he was going to have to come to earth later on because, unfortunately, we're not as smart as God. And we were not going to handle things very well. We were going to make mistakes, and we were going to go the wrong path, and we were, you know, we were just going to be going down that wrong road all the time. So... Jesus had to learn all of these things about what God was doing so that when he came to earth, he could get us back on that right path. Man, is God smart. I don't know if I would want to be that smart. It would be kind of scary to be that smart, wouldn't it? Everybody depending upon you, everybody wanting your opinion, but God does a really good job of that. So just remember, you are never alone. God has your path set for you. He knows where you need to go. He knows you may take a few detours, but that's okay. He'll get you back on that right path. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you alone are our creator. You are powerful and so creative. Thank you for making all things very good and for sending your son to live with us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go to worship and worship. Thank you. All right. Oh, I didn't check the basket for anymore. Any more than that? No. Okay. All right. We have a few uh, prayer concerns to share this morning. Uh, Paulette asked for prayers of the family of Albert Hickey uh, on his passing. Um, Janet Schumann uh, reminds us that we want to keep Sherry Brandenburg in our prayers as she is at St. Francis in Greenwood. Tessa Blackheader asks for prayers for her uh, cousin Steve uh, Coger, who is in the hospital with some serious heart issues. And Emily Hankins uh, asks for uh, prayers for traveling mercies as she uh, has the joy of traveling with her grandmother to uh, Connecticut, but they've got 13 hours of driving, so we want to cover them in prayer. And uh, Cynthia lifts up a praise for the rain. Indeed, indeed. Well, let's hold those uh, uh, praises and concerns in our hearts as we uh, together go to God in prayer. Will you bow with me? You are Mother, Father, God, our source of life. In the beginning, you made all things and you made them good. Your image is seen within us, and you are constantly drawing all things together in harmony and joy. You, compassionate Savior, have been the source of new life and a new covenant. You came among us and took on our image to show us a way to peace. You, communing spirit, you are God in us, 
our advocate, our strength, our source of hope. You allow us to commune with God in ways that would be impossible without you. With you, we are freely embraced in triune love. Thank you, O oh God, for all that you are. And as we come before you, O oh God, to praise you and honor you, we also ask your presence over our concerns and praises. We have lifted up some concerns already today, Lord, uh, but I know that there are other concerns represented within this congregation. And so we want to pause just a moment to individually have a time to lift those up to you. Again, oh God, we give you thanks for how you are present in every aspect of our lives. No matter how far away we feel from you, you are there waiting for us to turn and recognize your presence. Thank you for all that you are for us. You're, you're our strength, you're our hope, you're our peace, our joy, and love, of course. There's so many reasons to praise you and give you thanks, and so we pause just now to individually lift up our praises to you. Thank you, oh God. You are amazing. Your love for us is amazing. You call each of us, each and every one of us, your beloved child. But we know, Lord, that even as each of us is your child, we are part of the family of God, the body of Christ. So we now take our individual, individual voices and we blend them together and we say the prayer that you taught us. We say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm just a poor with every stranger a traveling through this world of woe but there's no sickness or no danger in that fair land to which I go I'm going my father I'm going there no more to roam I'm just a going over Jordan I'm just a going over home I know that clouds around me I know my way is rough and steep but beauteous fields lie just before me where we are no more shall we I'm going there to see my mother she said she'd meet me when I come. I'm just so going over Jordan. I'm just
the circle went over home on the circle with a land stranger on the circle Logan, that was awesome. You did such a good job. We're blessed to have you here. Uh, scripture reading today, we have from two books. First reading is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. From John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. The Word of God for the people of God. I want you to take just a moment here and think what pops into your mind when you hear the word family? Think about how you might define the traditional family. Dictionary.com defines the traditional family as a basic social unit consisting of parents and their children, considered as a group whether dwelling together or not. I can remember for many years that the traditional family was considered to be a mom, a dad, 2.5 children, and a dog. That was the, the statistic. <laughs> but as uh, time has gone on and as I have grown, I have figured out that isn't necessarily all that traditional. <laughs> and that families actually come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, configurations and colors. Um, and, and some families don't look anything like um, that original traditional family, right? Some of your families do not look like that. Here's a, a few families here uh, that do not look like 2.5 children and a dog <laughs> and a mom and a dad. Um, so, and that's because family is more than how we are related Family is more than how we are related. Family is a reflection of how we are relational. Family is a reflection of how we are relational. So how do we learn to be relational? How do we learn to be family? Well, we are blessed because we have an example in God's perfect family. Will you pray with me? Holy One, we come seeking you, and we ask you to speak to us. Speak to us through your holy scriptures. Speak to us in ways that help and direct us. Speak to us in ways that change us. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Christ we pray. Amen. Perfect family. That sounds like an oxymoron, actually, to me. <laughs> I grew up believing that there was a perfect family out there somewhere. Um, it just wasn't mine. <laughs> in fact, my brother Tim used to say that our family put the fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> As an adult, as I got to know more and more people and met more and more families, I've come to believe that every family, no matter how wonderful they are, has just a little some dysfunctional in there somewhere, right? Because families like indivi are like individuals, and none are perfect. However, God is this perfect family. And we see the perfection uh, uh, that's relational existence in Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, what is known as the Trinity. 
Now, if most of us are honest, the Trinity really baffles us and confuses us. We don't know how to explain it, so we try to avoid the subject a lot. <laughs> and that's okay. But we are beginning a sermon series on family. And so, God's perfect family seemed like the perfect place to start. <laughs> So there in Genesis 1, we see already a glimpse of the eternal trinity. God's spirit, the word can also be translated as breath, wind, or mind, is hovering over the waters or moving over the waters. And while that is happening, God brings forth light. So we see both of those together already right there in the beginning in Genesis. I found it fascinating. I I, I really just learned this yesterday as I was doing some other research. The Hebrew word in the scripture here in Genesis for God is uh, Elohim, which is a plural noun. So the Hebrews knew, even though quite often any adjectives or adjectives that are used for Elohim are a singular, because there is one God, but this God is plural. I loved that. Then we move to John's prologue, the prologue to the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. And this word then became flesh in Jesus of Nazareth, right? So another way to say this was, in the beginning was the divine family, the perfect family. Now, some of you are sitting there going, what in the world is she talking about? What what in the world was Janet? What? 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 (laughs) And that's okay. I can remember I was leading a Bible study in uh, Missouri, and there was a young mom that was there, and we were studying the Gospel of John, and we started there at the beginning reading uh, the prologue, in, and uh, um, I, I was, you know, reading along. She went, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Are you saying that Jesus was there from the beginning? Are you saying that Jesus was part of creating the world? How did I miss that all these years? Because she had been raised in the church. And then she started to cry. She started to cry because she'd had a revelation. The Spirit had finally revealed something to her that she had missed for a really long time. And in that revelation, all of a sudden, everything she thought she knew was changing, but also falling together at the same time. It was beautiful to be able to witness this part of her uh, faith journey. I was honored to be able to do that. And I often think of that moment in the look on her face of just like blown away and in complete awe all at the same time. So yes, Jesus has always been just as God has always been and just as the Holy Spirit have always been. And I know that's really hard for us to get our brains to process or wrap around these kinds of concepts because it's beyond our understanding, right? This is part of the mystery of who God is. And then at some point, we know in history, Jesus came from where Jesus was with God here to earth, uh, took on flesh, and walked among us. But Jesus told people over and over again, if we look again in the Gospel of John, there's a time where he's in the temple. It is the the festival of the dedication there in Jerusalem, and some Jews have come, and they're trying to challenge him, and he says to them, the Father and I are one. Again, later on, when Jesus is praying for his disciples, in fact, is praying for all of us, just before he is betrayed there in the Gospel of John, he says, And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. And, of course, we have several places. Uh, John uh, 4.24 is one of those where, we, where God is talked about as spirit. So we have all these different scriptures that help support this concept of the Trinity and its existence since the beginning. 
Okay, brain, how can three things be one thing? That's really hard, right? That, those kind of concepts. I've heard uh, people use some, 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 some different um, visuals for that uh, in an apple and an egg. An apple is an apple, right? But it has a skin, it has flesh, and it has a core. But it's an apple. But it has three parts, but it's an apple. An egg has the shell, it has the white, it has the yolk. I like the egg better. That one fits better in my brain because <laughs> they're a little more distinct. Three distinct parts, but you can't have one without the other, right? You need all of them or you don't have an egg. So you have these three persons, three parts that make up this one thing. So three, the three persons of the Trinity, uh, they are in perfect communion with one another. They have this uniqueness of each person, but they also have this unity of being together. There's a love that flows from one to the other that is pure, it is complete, uh, it is eternal, and it is unconditional. They always have shared and always will share this mutuality of joy and peace and love. They are relationally harmonious. Something all of us strive for in our families, right? <laughs> and their perfect relationship then teaches us how to be relational in our families, to give something to strive for and to work towards. Uh, we may never reach perfection. In fact, we won't. <laughs> but we have this perfect example to keep working towards to be more harmonious in our family units. I don't know how many of you may have seen the movie or read the book The Shack. A few of you? I love this book. I love this book. This is one of the few books I've read more than once, uh, besides the Bible. Um, it, is, uh, it was written by William Paul Young, um, and I absolutely love his depiction of the Trinity. Um, in American Magazine, uh, scholar and author uh, David Nanatis uh, describes the three-in-one relationship. He says, in the book, the author attempts to put flesh, literally, on the Trinity. God the Father, a.k.a. Papa, is portrayed by a jolly Afri Afri African-American woman who can bake a mean scone while attending to the affairs of creation. Jesus is a carpenter who looks a lot like a Middle Eastern version of Bob Vila from, Vila from the, uh, this old house. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, a hippie Asian woman named Sara Yu, who tends a garden and flits in and out of scenes at will. The shack leads readers to think about how a trientarian God relates to humanity, albeit in ways some may find silly or worse. <laughs> but I love how the author shows these three different uh, entities in the book and in the movie. And what you notice as soon as you encounter all three is they are perfectly in tune with one another. They think each other's thoughts. They feel with each other's hearts. They completely know one another and yet are separate and have their own entity. It is absolutely beautiful. I just love it. Um, this, intersection, this interrelational family is also, of these three, is very playful. Um, it's very loving, it's very full of joy, uh, and uh, completely um, embraces peace. It is these three that make this perfect family. And in Genesis, we see the Trinity introduced to us in this perfect world, right, that God has just created. And for one glorious chapter... <laughs> All of creation is in harmony, right? Uh, working within God's perfect will and fulfilling God's perfect will. Pause and enjoy that because in the next chapter it all goes downhill. <laughs> because then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness. So the Trinity created the first human family 
Um, and uh, within, these, within just a very few verses, this perfect human family that has been created by this perfect family messes everything up, <laughs> right? They are the original authors of the blame game. Um, they uh, understand and start hiding in shame from God, and they, they exile themselves from the loving community of the Trinity, and for the rest of human history, God has worked, is working, and will continue to work. Has worked, is working, and will continue to work to bring each of God's children back into the fullness of the Holy Family. What follows in Genesis is a bunch of stories about a bunch of families. And we're going to be looking at these stories uh, through the summer of these different families. We'll see things like sibling rivalry, adultery, trickery, betrayal. You know, your nice traditional families. <laughs> but as we look at all these different families and through the messiness of their lives, what we're going to also find is that God continues to work to reconcile the world to God's self. And that's where uh, these stories will bring us hope that in the midst of our own um, imperfect families, messy lives, we can know that God is moving, nevertheless, to reunite all of God's people into one divine family. Um, I get a daily devotion from uh, Father Richard Rohr and his meditation on Friday. I, God's just really cool how God puts things together. I have to share this with you. So Father Richard Rohr said, Sadly, the doctrine of the Trinity hasn't exercised much influence in Christian understanding of God. If most Christians, Catholic or Protestant, are questioned about their real image of God, it's generally an old man sitting on a throne. He's upset half the time, and it's our job to make this God happy. This, of course, has almost nothing to do with our actual doctrine of the nature of God. What our tradition believes is that God is a fountain fullness of love. A fountain fullness of love. A water wheel flowing constantly in one direction. Father to Son, Son to Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit to Father. Always outflowing, always outpoured, always giving, never taking, but only receiving what the other gives. It would take the rest of your life to try to comprehend what that means. Many of us say we believe in the Trinity, but we really don't because we don't know what to do with it. We can't even imagine it. All of our metaphors are simply words trying to grab at the reality of the experience of God that ultimately can't be verbalized. It can only be experienced. And isn't that when God becomes most real to us, when we experience God? Whether that is through Creator Christ or Holy Spirit, different times we experience God in different ways. And how we exp experience our Creator, how we experience Christ, how we experience the Holy Spirit, that's how we experience each other, right? That, through that relationship, through the triune God relationship, through these three in one, that it then shapes us for how we are in relationship with one another. Well, at least hopefully. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> As our connection to God works in and through us so that we are in better relationship with one another. Some criticize uh, the image of Christ in the shack because at one point Jesus looks unfavorably on organized religion and wishes that people could just get along despite their differences. 
But Jesus has longed for this all along, right? He's longed for us all along to embrace the amazing relationship that we experience through our triune God, not only with the holy, but with one another. Jesus prayed that we would be one as Jesus and the Father are one. As we seek to be the family of God, may it be so. Will you pray with me? Oh, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit, how grateful we are that you show us what a beautiful family relationship can be. May we continue to move in closer relationship with each of you so that we are better at our relationships within this place. May we continue to commune with you, O oh God, so that when we commune with one another, we do it in love and grace and joy and peace. Thank you for all that you teach us and how you move and have your being in us, through us, and around us. It is through all your holy names we pray. Amen. When Jesus came and put on flesh and walked among us, he kept saying, I came to show you the Father. The Father and I are one. Because we hadn't quite truly grasped God at that point. And then before Christ left, he said, and I am sending the advocate to you. Christ knew the Holy Spirit. He knew God, and he knew that they, we all needed to work together. Christ then told us to remember him, and in remembering him, we remember all those parts, right? We remember also his Father and the Spirit that he sent among us. When we come to this table we celebrate all that God is. Christ sets the table, invites all of us to come and celebrate the feast. doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or any church. If you seek the love and grace that's part of that communion, you are welcome at the feast. Hopefully everyone was able to pick up communion at the door. Is there anyone who needs communion that didn't get it when they came in? All right. Well, then let us sing to prepare our hearts for communion. Number Jesus and his disciples were gathered there in a large upper room celebrating the Passover feast together. I think it's interesting that so many of the disciples looked at themselves as separate from the rest of the Jewish community because they were followers of Christ. And yet Christ never saw anyone as outside of his community. They were, might have been people who hadn't chosen to step into it, but he never rejected any of them. He might challenge them in one way or another to open their minds, but he was always ready to accept them in. As he sat there that night, looking around the table, 
knowing that those around the table were about to go through a couple of the worst days of their lives. He wanted to love on them. He wanted them to know how much they were loved. Even though they had no idea what they were about to encounter. He knew that there was going to be a betrayal in the garden by one that was there at the meal. He knew that there would be this sort of trial that would happen overnight. And he knew that he would go to the cross and there would die. He also knew that he'd then be laid in a tomb, a borrowed tomb. He knew what that was going to do to them and their very insular <laughs> feelings at the time. For them, those at the table, the world was going to end. All of it was over. But Christ knew that beyond all of this darkness, there was going to be resurrection, where light would burst into the world in a new way for all hearts to be made bright and full of love. And the joy of that kept him there for that one last supper. And so he stood and he took bread and he lifted it to heaven and he blessed it, he broke it, and he passed it among them. He said to them, this is my body given in sacrifice for you. I ask that when you do this in the future, you remember me and my love for you. He stood again. This time he took a cup and he lifted that to heaven and blessed it. And he passed that among them as well. He said, take and drink of this, all of you, this. This is the blood of the new covenant. And when you do this, remember me and my love for you. In just a moment, we'll hear some music, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and partake of the bread that's in the bottom of your cup. Um, this is a reminder to us that we are to have this individual relationship with Christ, right? We have our own individual relationship with God. But I'm going to ask you to hold the juice, and we're going to partake of that together. Again, reminding us that we are also part of the body of Christ. For these gifts, let us pray. Thank you for this holy sacrament, and may we never approach the communion table in an unworthy manner, knowing that as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until his coming again. In your most holy name we pray, amen. Let us now partake as one in the body of Christ. And through his blood we are made new. Our cups are empty. Our hearts are filled. Having been blessed by a time of communion, we come now to that time in our service where we lay before the Lord our tithes and our offerings, just a little bit of what God has given us and ask us to be good stewards of. Join me in prayer, please. 
God and Father of all, we praise you that all things which come to us are yours. We are thankful that you provide for us financially, you provide for us spiritually, and you provide for us in so many ways. Blessed Lord, we give your tithes and offerings now, but more importantly, we give you our love. Amen. Um, faith in action. We've got Vacation Bible School tonight. Uh, so if you're not a part of it, please cover us in prayer. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, we still have registrations over there if you need to take those to someone you know that would like to join us. Um, and because of Vacation Bible School, uh, the women's uh, Bible study and the ladies learning together that normally meet on Wednesday will not be meeting this week uh, because of Vacation Bible School. No, no praise team practice. None of those things are happening because we're going to Vacation Bible School. <laughs> I hope you can come back and join us next week when we are going to be uh, honoring all those who are father figures within the church. We're going to have pops with pies, which means everybody's going to come down and celebrate the pops, and we're all going to eat pie. So, in case you thought only the pops get to walk out with a pie. No. <laughs> so, uh, I hope you can come back and join us for that. If you are a guest with us today, please be sure and visit our Welcome Center. Uh, so we'll have a little gift for you over there. I also wanted to let you know that yesterday we had uh, the Humane Society fundraiser uh, out back, and we did a blessing of the pets. Uh, the uh, Humane Society got over $500 in uh, cash and gift card donations, and with the food donations, they felt like it, overall it was like over $1,000 uh, worth of donations. So um, wonderful for all of those that supported there. And then uh, had the honor of blessing a total of 25 pets, which included 22 dogs, two turtles, and a gecko. <laughs> so that was very fun. Um, so there we go. Thank you for all those that prayed for me. Uh, during that, too, because it, it went well. No nips, no bites, no scratches. It was all good. Um, there were two turtles that came. I only held one because they said the other one was a biter, so I didn't hold that one. I said, no problem. We're not holding that one. All right, so um, my challenge for you this week is to continue your uh, growth and your relationship with our triune God. Look for the ways you are experiencing God, uh, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit throughout this week because God shows up in lots of different ways and through lots of different people and creatures. And we give thanks for that. Um, if you are someone who's never de dedicated your life to following Christ and you're feeling called to do that today, or if you're someone who'd like to do a transfer of membership into this congregation, I'm going to ask you to come forward as we sing our closing hymn, number 701, We Shall Gather at the River. Or shall we gather at the river? We shall. We shall.
all for being here and for being there. Uh, we come together as the body of Christ and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. We're going to have Norm and Roberta come over into the East Room for anyone who wants to stop by and say something to them or their family and congratulate them. Thank you.